My message this morning, are the giants really necessary? You ever wondered that? Are they really necessary? Now, Father, I thank you, God, <clears throat> that you have an intent in your heart today. Lord, you're going to give strength to the weary. You're going to lift up those that are cast down. You're going to set free those that are oppressed. You're going to give courage to the faint-hearted. Lord, you're going to rise up as a mighty man of war, not outside of, but inside of your people. God Almighty, thank you for the victories that are going to be won today. Before this hour is done, there's going to be tremendous victory won in the hearts of many people. Father, we thank you, God. Oh, Lord, open your word, God. Make it real to us, Lord. Let it not be just a, a letter, a dead letter that we read, but let it be a living word in our hearts. Let faith arise, God. Help us, Lord, to embrace what we're about to hear. Help me, God, to speak it. Lord, overshadow the frailty of this human vessel and come, O oh God, and let your heart be manifested, your thoughts known, your directions laid hold of. Father, we thank you for this and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Are the giants really necessary? Deuteronomy chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, in other words, more powerful or stronger or more numerous, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when you are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. Now this is very much in the same manner that I feel the Lord has commissioned me to do today. <clears throat> and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Let me say it again. You shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day to battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Now, how exciting it must have been for that first generation having escaped captivity out of Egypt to come to the shores of such incredible promise, only to find that giants are occupying what God clearly told them was to be their inheritance. Remember, the spies came back and they said, yes, it's everything exactly as it was told to us. And they were carrying, of course, a staff between them and, and grapes literally so boughs of grapes so large that it took two men to carry them and here they are bringing the fruit of this land in and to the natural eye it's everything that God said it was but they said there's a problem you see there are giants in the land now <clears throat> we we feel like we can't go against them we felt like grasshoppers in their sight that's actually what the scripture says they were so powerful they were so strong and no doubt they had weaponry that they had formed and they had spears and swords and such like. And these are people just having come out of captivity that most likely they don't have this type of weaponry with them or anything even that approximates it. All they really have are the promises of God given to them. Now, when we consider according to Psalm 24, 1, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, then the question arises, why couldn't he have put the giant somewhere else? Why, why couldn't he have put pygmies in the promised land? Or just regular five foot guys with sticks like the children of Israel had? Why giants? Why couldn't this journey be made, have been made a little easier? And that's the same question that some of you are asking today. You've come here with deep set questions in the heart and you're saying, if God is with me, if his promises are mine, why do I face such violent opposition? Why is it so hard? Why are the obstacles to getting there so high, so wide and seemingly so impassable? 
I've read the promises and I believe them. And I'm, I'm moving with all my heart towards them. But set before me are these incredible obstacles. That, and I don't know how I'm ever going to get through it. I don't know how I'll ever get beyond it. I don't know how I'll ever get around it. It's so powerful. It, it seems to occupy the place that I know it should be. But how do I get through it? How do I defeat this thing? Have you ever noticed that in Scripture the giants always seem to be on the opposing side? How come they get the horses, the chariots, the armor, the size, the weight, and the weapons? And we feel, as the children of Israel did, like grasshoppers with sticks sent to fight against them. How come there was no Goliath in the army of Israel? Why was there nobody there? with similar size and capability and weaponry that could fight against this opposing voice that came against the children of God. We come often to God with deep-set questions in the heart. We ask ourselves, why am I sent to fight this giant despair with seemingly so little natural resource to overcome it? I know today there are people in this sanctuary that despair is a constant companion, rises up before you every day and tries to tell you you're never going to get through this. Yes, there's happiness in the promised land. Yes, there's peace. Yes, there's a quietness of spirit, a fixing as it is of the eye upon the prize of God. But you're never going to get there. Despair is always going to be with you. It's always going to be before you. You're never going to get through this giant of despair. Some people ask about, why is this hunger in my soul that hell is screaming in my face will never be satisfied? <clears throat> When the scripture says I should be full and the promises say that I should never hunger, why am I so hungry? Why is this scream in my heart for more of God and yet something against me opposes me every day telling me that I'll never make it and never be satisfied? Why this fury of opposition that's daily taking away my strength and making me feel like I'll never get to the other side? Is all this really necessary? Now, if you're an honest person, you've prayed that way. You've gone into the prayer closet and you've said, God, is this really necessary? Does this person really have to live next door to me? Does this other person have to really work next to me in the office? Do I really have to be in this marriage relationship? Some are saying that. Do I really have to be who I am, where I am, what I am, where I'm going? Is it all really necessary? God, if you are God, can't you just take it away in a moment? Can't you just clear it out of my way and kind of make the way into this full life I've heard about in Christ? Just, can, you just, can you just make it easier for me to get there? Why the struggle? Why the storm? Why the fury? Would it surprise you to know that the giants are necessary? and are placed in your path and in mine for a specific reason. It all stems from the Garden of Eden, folks. In the Garden of Eden, Satan came to Adam and Eve, and he said, if you partake of this fruit, you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And they reached out for something that had been forbidden them, and they partook of it, and the scripture says their eyes were opened. And this has been the frailty of the human condition of your condition and my condition. I'm talking about the natural part of us that is not under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's called the flesh. That part of us that wars against the Spirit of God. Amen. It's in your heart to be as God. And it's in your heart, it's in my heart to be as God. It's in the fallen nature of every human being ever born into this world. And because of this fall of sin of our father Adam, this seed of death and deception is, that's, the part of us that is alien to God is in us. It's what causes us to believe that we can figure things out. I can get through this. I can do this. It's what causes us to believe that we can get through it in our own knowledge, our own strength, and our individual or collective determination. You ever heard it? In our, together, we can get through anything. Together, we can rebuild. Together, we can become, we can be on top again. Together, we can, that's all out of the fallen human nature, the sin nature of man, which really says we can be as God. We can chart our destiny. We can see the way through any problem. We can overcome any mountain. We can get through any obstacle. And sadly, that arrogance of heart is going to be part of humanity until the world virtually destroys itself were it not for the 
intervention of God in, the, in his son, Jesus Christ. We have a tendency to only fervently start calling on God when things start spinning out of control. There's something in us, all of us, that says we can get through this. We can see our way. We can chart our course. We can win the victory. We can climb the mountain. We can do it. But God says, not my people. I'm not going to allow my people to live under that illusion. And to stop you from thinking that you can get through this life in your own strength, I'm going to place some things in front of you that, to prove to you that you can't. You are not strong enough to overcome what will be set before you. You are not powerful enough to get through it. You're not smart enough to figure it out. There are going to be obstacles placed before you. Every, every saint of God, you'll face this. If you're not facing it today, you will face it in the days to come. You and I will not be able to get through in our own strength by the mercy of God. And these giants are allowed by God to daily stand in opposition to our journey for one reason, that God is constantly trying to get through to his people. One thought, you are not God, I am. Amen. Remember the disciples that got into the boat and they had a promise, let's pass over to the other side, just like you and I have a promise today. And so they started to roll and things were going well and they were skilled at what they were doing. They were not novices to the sea, but suddenly, a giant storm with giant wind and giant waves comes their way. It's something they'd not encountered before. Something that they're not familiar with. Something that caused them to believe in spite of all their skill that they were going to perish at that particular moment. And it's at that moment that they called out to God who was in the boat with them. Jesus stood up and said three words, peace be still, to prove one more time that we can't get through these storms in our own strength. We can't overcome everything by our own reasoning. Folks, we need the Word of God. We need the presence of Christ. We need the person of Christ. We need God in us to get us through the days that we're going to have to face individually and collectively as a people. The victory comes when you and I, as King David was, are willing to stand against the giants which oppose us for one reason. Israel found itself on a mountainside opposed by a giant that no one in their human bravado, reasoning, training, or strength could face or fight. And God had to one more time turn to somebody, find somebody in the form this time of a young man who'd eventually become the king of Israel, who came into that camp and he knew he didn't have the strength to fight this giant in the natural. He knew that he didn't have the training. He knew he didn't have the armor. But he had one thing that God was looking for. And one thing that I feel with all my heart the Holy Spirit is looking for in the church of Jesus Christ today. He had a willingness to face every giant that would ever be put in front of him for one reason and one reason alone. He said, I will face it for the glory of God. I'll face it for the honor of God. I'll face it for the name of God. I'll go against this undeniably superior odds that are against me to prove so all may see and all may know David said that there is a God in Israel that God is on the throne that God is alive that God is reigning that God chooses the foolish things of the world he chooses the weak things things which are despised things which are nothing to bring to nothing things that are that no flesh can glory in his presence Paul says therefore him that glories let him glory in the Lord God is looking for a people again in this last hour of time that will rise up in our weakness. Rise up and say, listen, I have a promise of God and no giant is going to keep me from it. No power of hell is going to stop me. The Lord is looking for a people again in this generation who can say like the Apostle Paul, I'm persuaded, no height, no depth, no power, no angel, no principality, no name that is named. Nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. I am convinced, I am convinced that I have an inheritance in Christ and nothing can separate me from it. Praise be to God, praise be to God, praise be to God. Go to Psalm 18 please, if you will. Just for a moment with me. Psalm 18 verses 1 to 7. 
This is the testimony of David, the king of Israel, the man after God's heart. Here's what he says. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress I call upon the Lord, and I cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Did you know today that God hates your enemies more than you ever could? Did you know that he's waiting for an opportunity to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are right towards him? Those who come to God and say, Lord, would you consider the threatenings against me? And for the glory of your name, God, for the glory of your name, would you take me over or through this mountain? Would you bring me through this flood? Would you walk me through this fire? Would you give me the power to overcome this giant? Would you open this prison door? God, would you take me from image to image and glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord? Would you do it for one reason? That I may sing the praises of your name in this generation. That I may walk through when men's hearts are failing them for fear. When all the human strategies in our generation have failed. When the seas are roaring and men's hearts are failing them. When disease and pestilence are ravaging nation after nation. When war breaks out on every side. God Almighty, you will have a person in me that is just simply going to walk through with a song of praise. Not stopped by anything I see around me. I have an inheritance in my Christ. That's what's going to separate those that are gods in this generation from those that are not. Because we're living in a time, according to the writer of Hebrews, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Everything that professes to be godly but is not built on the truth of God will be shaken. But those that are gods will be strong according to the book of Daniel and will do exploits. They will walk where no one else has walked. They will go through what very few are able to go through. They will stand sovereignly empowered by the Holy Ghost. I believe it as surely as I live. I believe this with all of my heart. <laughs> Acts chapter 4. You'll find that in Psalm 18 when David prayed. The last verse we read, I believe it's verse 7. It says... The hills were moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There was this shaking. In Acts chapter 4, the early disciples, the early church, were threatened by the powers around them. Called before religious and in measure civil powers and told you must stop speaking this name. You're intending to bring this man's death on all of us. It was exposing the bankruptcy of their the theology, because the power of God was flowing through those disciples. And they threatened them, the scripture says, they threatened them, just like a Goliath. A voice said, this far, no farther. You'll stop right here. You'll speak this name no more. I know some of you are living under those threatenings right now. And I have every reason to believe they will increase in the days ahead. Verse 21 says, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. Acts chapter 4, verse 21. Because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? In other words, why do those who oppose the kingdom of God advancing, why do they imagine they can stop 
God from doing what God wants to do. How foolish and vain for that which is created to believe that it can stop the advance of that of the one who created them. The kings of the earth stood up, verse 26, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. In other words, for this early church, it seemed like everything was against them. Not just one Goliath on the other side of a valley, but it seemed now the whole society was rising up. There seemed to be a, a, a common threatening voice against the advance of that which we know today to be the church of Jesus Christ. But in verse 28, they say, For to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. In other words, they're standing up and they're, they're threatening this, to stop the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet all they're doing is what you have allowed them to do from before the creation of the world. This early church knew that God was in absolute control of everything. Nothing was out of his control. If the giants were there, they were there for a reason. And I do believe with all my heart, the only reason ever has been that the glory of God might be known. And now, Lord, verse 29, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. God, do what only you can do. Come and empower us. Come and give us a holy boldness that's birthed in the love of God for fallen humanity. Cause us, O oh God, to speak when everyone else says we should be silent. Stretch forth your hand through us, O oh God, and bring healing. Everywhere we go, bring healing. Heal the oppressed. Heal, God, those that are sick in their mind. Bring healing to the fearful. Bring healing, God, to the widow. Bring healing to the orphan. Bring healing to the hungry. God, stretch forth your hand. That has to be the cry of your heart and my heart in this generation. We can't just pray to survive, folks. That falls far short of the glory of God. If ever there was a time that we need to press through, it's now. Lord, let healing begin to flow through your vessel, through you. Not just me, not just a few in the church, but through you. God, let healing begin to flow. Let lives begin to be transformed. Let the glorious power of Christ begin to flow through this and these earthen vessels. Verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the place was shaken, rather, where they were assembled together. Remember the shaking in Psalm 18. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The place where they were was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's God's answer to every giant that you and I will ever have to face. To be filled with the Holy Ghost. To be filled with the Spirit of Almighty God. To be sovereignly and supernaturally empowered by God. Who cannot fail. He will not fail. He cannot fail. He can't be anything else but what he is. From everlasting to everlasting he said, I am God. I do not change. He has intertwined the honor of his name with you and I in bringing us through whatever we have to face. Not crawling over the finish line, but coming through in victory. Coming through with a song of praise. Coming through having triumphed over everything that was ever set against us. This is the finest hour for the church of Jesus Christ. If you can hear what the Spirit is speaking to his church, there's never been a finer hour than this one. Never been a deeper time that you and I need to, the deep need in our heart has to call out to the deep resources of our Christ. Never a time that you and I should call out more than we do now. God Almighty, shake the place where I am. Shake the foundation that Satan has tried to build under our feet and tell us this is as far as you're going to go. May as well build here. May as well stay here. May as well exist here. May as well just praise here. But you're going to stop here. You're going no farther. We got to pray in this generation. God, shake that foundation. Shake that foundation and take us now to another place. Lift us out of this place that the enemy would try to place our feet upon and put us upon the only rock that will stand in the coming storms, the rock Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. Back in Psalm 18 again. This is the cry of David. Verse 17. He said, he delivered me from my strong enemy. 
and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Verse 29, for by thee I've run through a troop, and by my God I have leaped over a wall. David said it didn't matter how violent the opposition was or how many they were. Hallelujah. No wonder he's called a man after God's heart. No wonder God's spirit was upon him in such great measure. And by my God, he said, I've leaped over a wall. No matter what the enemy put in front of me, I wasn't looking for any natural means to get over it or around it. I turned to God with all my heart as I've always done. And he proved himself to be faithful to me. Verse 33, makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon my high places. He gives me the power to climb what ordinary men can't climb and to go places where natural men can't go and to accomplish things that natural men can't do. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. In other words, no matter how sovereign or powerful the weaponry of my enemy seems to be, God, with nothing in my hands but a confidence in him, David said, gave me the power to snatch a bow of steel and literally break it in two, to realize that the weaponry of the enemy is an all-defeated weaponry. It's just a show. It does not have the last word. It has no permanent power in it. Verse 37, he said, I pursued my enemies and have overtaken them, and neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I've wounded them. that They're not able to rise. They're fallen under my feet. Verse 42, <clears throat> Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind, and I cast them out as dirt in the streets. This is what the Lord wants to do with everything that is opposing you going forward and becoming everything that God intends you to be for the glory of his name. Verse 46, he says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It's God that avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me, and thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises to thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. David said, Therefore I'll give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the heathen. I will walk among those who don't know you as a living testimony of your power. I will open my mouth and I will tell others what you have done for me. That's the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ. It's not just a series of facts and figures about God that we present to this generation. It's not sufficient to throw a tract on somebody's desk and hope that's going to make a difference, as good as that may be. No, God has a living testimony in the earth of the fact that he is God of the fact that he sovereignly has all power, of the fact that he can take anybody through anything that this world has to throw at them. He can give power to overcome the most fierce of opposition that will ever come against you. And God says, I'm going to give you as I gave to David, and I'm going to give it to his seed, he said, forevermore. Now, the seed of David is the church of Jesus Christ. We know that. I don't have time to prove that, but that is, David is in the lineage of Christ. We are that seed. He said, I'm going to give that seed a song, and that song is going to be sung among the heathen. You're going to sing it in your family. You're going to sing it in your apartment building. You're going to sing it in your workplace. You're going to sing it on the street when everyone else around you might be terrified and finally coming to their wit's end. You've only begun to scratch the glory that God wants to give to his own name through your life. Faith will begin to arise in your heart like never before. Don't be stopped by the opposition that's against you today. Don't be silenced. Don't build on a foundation and worship at a place that is short of the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. Don't settle for mediocrity when the power of God is at your disposal. Don't buy the lie that you are going to go this far and no farther. Don't give in to the voice that screams at you every morning that you're, you have no education, that you're, you have no power, you can't speak, you have no ability, you have no testimony. You, why would anybody listen to you? Don't listen to those voices. Don't listen to these things. Do like David did. Take a promise from the word of God. Find a promise for your life and run into that valley and face that giant 
And so you come to me with weapons and swords. But he said, I come to you in the name of the God of all hosts, the God of Israel. I come to you in the name of the one that by your vocal opposition, you've defied not men. You've defied not the armies of Israel. You've defied the God of the armies of Israel. You've defied him. And David took that promise and ran to meet that giant. And folks, you've got to do this now. You cannot just settle in and settle for some plan B, substandard form of Christian victory. Don't try to figure it out. Get a promise from God and run towards whatever that thing is that's trying to stop you in your tracks. I've lived this. I've known this. I've walked this. It's become part of my life. Praise be to God. Folks, stand against your enemies now. In the power of God, you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to have the strength to get around it. As a matter of fact, you don't have the strength. That's why the giants are there in front of you. But when you turn to God and say, Lord, honor your name. Take this weak, foolish vessel, God, and confound that which says I can't go any further. Confound these demonic powers. Confound this opposition that stands against me and says this far and no farther in my life. Praise be to God. Therefore, he says, as David, he, I will give thee thanks, O Lord, among the heathen. I will sing praises to thy name. Not just in church, but I, there'll be something so deep done in my life that outside of church, I won't have a choice but to sing praises to your name. I will be compelled because there will be a song in me. Remember, David spoke about this song in the Psalms. He said, the Lord heard my cry. He lifted me out of a miry pit. He put my feet on a solid rock. And he said, he put a song in my mouth and many will see it and fear and turn to the Lord. A song that's not heard, it's seen. A song of confidence in God. A song of victory in our Christ. A song that is not found in anything of the natural man. And it's not found anywhere in this world. But it is found in God. Hallelujah. I remember, folks, I remember when I came to Christ. And you know my story after nine years of fear and hell of God in just a, a minute of time. And it was really a minute setting me free from all these years of having to take Valium and other things and trying to conquer an incredible fear in my heart that had gripped my life. And for all intents and purposes, without the intervention of God, would have kept me all, most of my days. I don't know if I ever would have gotten free from this thing. But in a moment of time, I found a promise in this book. If God be for us, who can be against us? All I had, I didn't have a, a dump truck full of pebbles. I had one stone like David had and went downstairs in my living room and faced that giant that had dominated my life and tried to tell me that one day I would die because of these attacks that would come on me. And I stood against that giant and in 30 seconds of time to a minute, I was completely set free. That's many, many, many years ago now. And by God's grace, I will never, ever, ever go back there. Never, ever. I'd rather die than go back to that place. I want to challenge you with everything in me. Get up and fight. But do it for the right reason. Fight for the glory of God. When the Lord set me free, I couldn't stop speaking his name. I got me into a lot of trouble. And a lot of opposition came, but I couldn't stop. I could not stop speaking his name. And in spite of the opposition, men and women started coming to Christ on the left and on the right, all over the place, because they saw a song. They saw something that had nothing to do with circumstance. It was a, an inner song, something of a confidence and a trust in Almighty God. This generation needs to see this kind of worship again. It's, it's good that they can come to this house and hear us singing through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. That's wonderful that we can invite people and they can hear that. But are they hearing that song on Monday in the office? Are they, are they hearing it in the grocery store when you only have $15 to get through the week on food? Are, are they hearing that song? Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. And is it a song that's real? Is it really in your heart? In your neighborhood, when everybody is muttering about the inability to accomplish or to move or to socially advance or to go anywhere, are they hearing your song? 
Oh, I'm going somewhere. I'm, I'm really going somewhere. God is taking me somewhere. It's amazing this journey I'm on. Folks, if, if people in New York City would hear this song through the body of Christ, it would be amazing the number that would come to him. This song of victory that only God can give. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Therefore will I give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises to thy name. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. That you give abilities, Lord, and you give victories to those who trust you. I'm asking you, Lord, today, in this house, for incredible spiritual victory. I'm asking, Father, for faith to arise in the hearts of your people. And the people would stand up and lifelong, lifelong bondages would be broken. Lifelong fears would be overcome. Lifelong wrong impressions would be destroyed. You said in your word, Lord, that you give us the power to cast down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I'm asking today, God, that everyone who's embraced a wrong image, everyone who's living under this voice that says this far, no farther, would stand and face this giant and see its utter and total defeat in a moment of time. Lord, you are inviting us into something. You're inviting us as a church into an incredible victory. You're inviting us into the fullness of your life. You're inviting us, Lord, to walk with you and glorify your name by being made into people we could never hope to be and take it places we could never hope to go. Help us, Lord. Help us, God, not to do what the children of Israel did. Help us, God, not to turn back. Help us, Lord, to go in to this place of promise with whatever little strength we have and a full heart of confidence in our God. Thank you, Father. God, you're going to destroy these weapons of hell, and you're going to do it at this altar. You're going to do it in the next few minutes. I believe it, God, with all my heart. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to go into a moment of worship. Now, as we do, I'm going to ask those in the annex who want to to stand and step between the screens. Here in the main sanctuary, make your way to this altar, and you know who you are. God is speaking to you. Your heart is burning. It looks impossible, and probably is to you, but it's not impossible to God. And God is speaking something to your heart, a place that he wants to take you or into or out of, either or. It has to start by coming out of something before you can go into somewhere else. But you've just given into these voices for too long. It's now time to move ahead in faith. Would you join these who are already at this altar as we stand together? And we're going to worship for the next 20 minutes or so. Get your victory when you come here. Let God speak to your heart that you've won this battle. Every so often, there is a day and there is a moment in the life as believers where the Holy Spirit comes upon us and says, today you are different. That you have come to me and it's been years of a lifelong struggle or something that you felt in your heart of hearts you could never win over. It was too deep in the character. And you came into this place and in your heart there was a despair. And God knew it. And he's saying, this day I have shown you that who has been speaking to you and saying this far and no farther has only been a giant. It's only been a giant. And we sang today, giants die. Giants die. Hallelujah. 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 It is not true. It is not the Spirit of God that told you this far and no farther. That was an enemy.
And this day, the Spirit of God has said, I am with you. My hand is upon you. I am putting, and I have put promises in your heart, and my spirit is with you. And when that voice says, this far and no farther, that you and I are going to say, Lord, this giant is going to die because I am, I am going to rise to say, for your glory, Lord, for your glory, I am going to move forward, and I'm going to take a promise. And it's a promise of life. It's a promise of life for me and death to this giant by the mighty spirit of God. And Lord, I will not be defined by an enemy. I will not be told by an enemy. I go this far and no farther. Lord, you tell me giants die. This lie dies. I rise in the power of God and I move forward. Hallelujah. Into what you have for me. By the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, I move forward for the glory of God. Today, I am different. Hallelujah. If you believe that today, if you believe that today, if there has been a release in your heart, you just begin to praise Him today, for He is worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the victory, the victory, the victory, the victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. We stand and we move forward in the mighty name of Jesus. Fo